Hello, and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2017 webinar series, Professional Water Well Drilling in Africa, Incentives and Support. My name is Rob Goodyear, and I'm the Managing News Editor at E4C. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. If you are following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar. Drilled water wells are vital for Africa to achieve universal access to clean drinking water. The water must be safe, affordable, and available through services that last. To get there, these wells or boreholes need to be built in a professional manner. Design, siting, procurement, construction, project management, and supervision are key elements within a professional sector. This webinar will present a guidance note that has been developed by SCAP Foundation and UNICEF to raise professionalism through six proposed areas of work. Those include the institutional framework, groundwater data, capacity of personnel, project design, implementation, and monitoring, raising awareness, and adequate investment. To present this material today, we've invited two leading voices in water, sanitation, and hygiene for global development. Dr. Kirsten Danner is a rural water supply specialist at SCAP Consulting, an independent Swiss organization in the fields of development and humanitarian aid. Dr. Danner also leads the secretariat of the Rural Water Supply Network. Jose Casti is a UNICEF water sanitation and hygiene specialist based at the UN headquarters in New York. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinars series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team by using the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Today's webinar is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C's webinars page, as well as our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on the slide. And before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities, including access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and opportunities such as jobs and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join E4C's passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website, www.engineeringforchange.org org to learn more and sign up. Our next webinar is next month on April 25th. Baron Roth at the New School will present how to use citizen science to track marine plastic pollution. Please see the E4C professional development page for more information and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, check your email for an invitation to the webinar directly. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see first where everyone is from. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please go ahead and type in your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon in the top right corner of this screen. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go in the chat window. And feel free to send a private chat to Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you might have. During the webinar, 
please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. And again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon in the top right corner. If you're listening to the audio podcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. Following the webinar, request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session. Please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page. Let's see if we can see where some people are joining us from today. New York City and Michigan, welcome. Looks like we have a lot of people on the call, just um, haven't seen a lot of people entering in where you might be from. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenters, Dr. Kristen Dannert. Dr. Kristen Dannert is a rural supply specialist, rural water supply specialist, who has spent 16 years developing in-country capacity for operation and maintenance, cost-effective borehole drilling, technology adoption, and sector performance monitoring. She has provided face-to-face -face advisory and capacity development services to national and local governments, NGOs, and the private sector in over 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as remote support for others. She lived and worked in Uganda for 10 years up to 2008 when she moved to Switzerland to join SCAP. Since 2009, she has led the Secretariat of the Rural Water Supply Network. And Jose Hesi Canuto is a UNICEF WASH specialist based at headquarters in New York. Jose works on global water supply strategies and has developed, a, developed missions in different regions of the world, including Africa, Asia, and Latin America, providing technical guidance to governments and UNICEF country offices on innovative and cost-effective solutions to rural water supply and climate resilience. Prior to joining UNICEF, Jose held various positions as water and sanitation consultant and as a supervisor both in the public and private sector. And it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Jose Hesti, who will start the presentation. Thank you very much, Rob. Perhaps if you, uh, you could just confirm that uh, you are hearing me well, uh, everybody can hear me. Maybe if you can, I, I'm assuming that yes, but just to double check. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so as I, as I was saying, you know, it's a first it's a pleasure for us to to um, be with you today and doing this this presentation. This is a very important topic for us. Um, and we are, um, you know, devoting uh, a lot of our time, you know, to this subject. And um, it is a great opportunity, you know, that we are able to to share um, with you. So I will just go ahead and I will start, you know, with uh, with the presentation. Um, so uh, this first slide to give a little bit of a context and background to to this initiative or to this uh, this work, we just wanted to to raise. Uh, Basically, the three three quick points. Um, you may be aware that uh, it is estimated that 45% uh, um, of the global population depends on groundwater for domestic uses. Um, in Africa, where I'm now on, on an assignment, groundwater dependence is even higher than that, and it's estimated to be over 75%. Here in Africa, these first populations and communities within the continent are particularly relying on groundwater. Um, they rely on hand dug wells, historically playing a major role in, in both rural and, and very urban areas. Uh, we also see cities in the continent, uh, in the continent here in Africa, particularly in Nigeria, where there is also a high dependence on groundwater for urban water supplies. But groundwater used for irrigation is also forecasted to increase. The potential for further development of irrigated agriculture fed by groundwater is, consider, is, consider, is considerable, uh, and it's estimated to be between 20 and 49 percent of the cropland of the continent here again here in Africa. 
So with these bases, there is no doubt that groundwater supplies and boreholes in general are play uh, a tremendous role in achieving the sustainable development goals in the continent. Um, in rural areas of countries, gradually improved supply coverage, new sources are required in difficult to reach locations and, and also in locations with, uh, with very complicated hydrogeological conditions. And here the risk of drilling dry boreholes are, as we know, high. So managing this uncertainty is one of the challenges of, of meeting the, the sustainable development goal for the drinking water target. So we are discussing the, the importance of groundwater development and, and borehole construction to achieve universal access, right? But, but we can say that, that the drive for numbers of users over the last 15 years has actually led to, to a fall in the quality of, of project implementation. And this is one of our concerns. So if the emphasis is on, on large number of boreholes and, and the capacity to properly manage implementation, and I'm saying implementation not even, not even post-construction. If the, if the capacity to manage implementation is neglected, then construction quality suffers. Uh, actually, different estimates give us an idea of how much uh, sustainability of water points is a key concern. We have the studies from the Rural Water Supply Network back in 2009, indicating that between 10 and 65% of the hand pumps in 20 African countries were not functional at the time of a uh, spot check. Um, further now we have studies um, in 2013 and 2015 uh, telling us about non-functionality rates between 14 and 26 percent. What we can see here in, the, in this figure is a comparison of the functionality of water points in four countries um, compared with uh, the age of the boreholes. And the figure as you can see, shows that functionality falls as the age rises. And this is no news to us, right? This is something that is expected. But, you know, while this is to be expected, um, pay attention to the drop in functionality down to 70 to 85 percent already in the first or one, uh, the first one to two years of construction. And this is a real case uh, of concern for us because we see a huge drop in functionality and therefore in the sustainability of these uh, water points very, very quickly. So we are assuming that something may be going wrong already um, with um, the infrastructure. When boreholes fitted with, hump, uh, with pumps uh, function poorly, um, and we know that ultimately they fail, the physical problems are typically uh, around three areas, right? One is the low yield, for example, inadequate quantity of water or seasonal unreliability. The second one can be poor quality water, for example, high turbidity, poor bacteriological or chemical quality, and then we have uh, another area which is mechanical failure of the pump. So on, whole, uh, on the whole, these physical problems are, are caused by one or more secondary reasons, as we can see uh, in the figure. In turn, these secondary reasons are uh, a consequence of other deeper underlying causes. So it, is, it takes a little bit of an investigating role, you know, just understanding what is, what is going wrong. It takes a little bit of a detective role uh, to try to dig in into the real issues and the root of the problems. You know, uh, just perhaps a comment here when we are thinking about rehabilitating water points, you know, our advice always is to you know, rather than just go and rehabilitate things without having a full understanding of what might have been drawn, you know, to have some thorough assessment of, uh, of the root causes of, of the problem. Kirsten? Thank you very much, Jose. Okay, and if you can spot the deliberate mistake on this slide, you'll get extra points. Um, so technical problems, this is just a slide to show you some of the kind of technical problems that we see, the physical problems. So, the top three slides here, you have, can, um, apparently nobody can hear me, is that right? Can you hear me? It seems Erica has a problem hearing. Okay, I can, can, hear. Hear. Okay. I can hear you well. Great, Christine. okay, thanks a lot. 
So just looking at the top three photographs on the left here, here we see basically rust, corrosion. This is um, the pump rod and the, um, the rising main connector. So and these, these have all been installed just for one year. So technical problem. On the right, the, the slide there, this is again a one year old um, pump apron and you see already you have a cracked apron. So there are issues there about quality of cement, quantity of cement, curing. This is not what a facility should look like within one year. Moving down to the middle left, a facility that's been constructed but no wall has been put around. In this particular country, they construct walls around hand pumps to prevent animals from coming um, to, the, or to the borehole. So the well's been done, it's been installed, it's been paid, but the work hasn't been done according to the specifications. The next slide, the, the next picture in the middle, you just see the quality. And this is not um, an apron that's been around for a long time. This is relatively new, a year, a year and a half old. You've got rust issues, you've got wearing away already of the, the, the superstructure. And likewise, on the left, you have a problem there. You, you have the, um, the, the, the pipe basically um, at an angle. So you, you, don't, you don't have, probably don't have a straight hole all the way down. The big photograph on the bottom right, you see um, two of the rising mains with massive corrosion. Um, so these are some of the problems that can happen if the engineering isn't done well. Um, and if you go to the next slide for me, Jose, underlying um, the, the, the problem of, of, yeah, of corrosion, you have a number of issues. So corrosion is one of the big water quality issues, particularly in Africa. And it's a problem that's been around for 30 years and still hasn't been solved. Um, essentially, when you have um, water with a pH of less than 6.5, or quite acidic, when you install galvanized materials, it will corrode. And what you see here, the picture on the top right, is water that's being pumped early in the morning. Horrendous brown, muggy water coming out. And there isn't a problem in terms of health, but there is a problem that people reject the water because of the taste and the color and the aesthetics. So they don't want to wash the clothes, they can't cook the rice, and it tastes badly. What's interesting, and if you look at the bottles on the left, is, is these are samples that were taken over time. And the bottle on the left was taken first thing in the morning. The bottle on the right um, has been as the well's been pumped over several minutes, um, up to an hour, and the water is clearing. And this is a clear example of corrosive materials in the, the in the ground. So the hand pump is corroding. It sits overnight. The iron builds up in the water, and then when you first pump in the morning, you get filthy water coming out, and eventually it clears. And this is not good enough. And certainly, as Jose mentioned, if we're going to meet these sustainable development goals and get safe, clean drinking water to everyone, the world has to stop installing hand pumps that corrode. There has to be a huge change. And I can come back later to some of the reasons um, that these are still being installed. And I'm talking to you as engineers. and. This is a, um, a bit of a cryptic diagram, but it's a very interesting um, research study that's been done in Uganda, trying to understand the root causes for breakdown of pumps, breakdown of boreholes. Um, these are pumps that have completely failed, sources that have completely failed. And what the designers look, looked at is trying to get to these underlying causes. And they looked at both the pre-construction phase, what happens before the well goes in, the construction phase, and the post-construction, the management, the, the support afterwards. And I think what's very interesting for myself and for you as engineers is to see how many problems we have in the construction. So it's a traffic light system. So green is good, orange is medium, and red is very problematic. And you see with these sources that have failed, there is something it's gone wrong with the construction in practically all of the cases. Um, 
So we have the engineering problems. We really need to get the quality of the engineering right. And I think that's why it's so exciting to be, to be talking to you today. So let me hand back to Jose. See if you can hear me again? Yeah, I can hear you. You can? Okay, sure. Yeah. Good. So, so with this, we we move a little bit into we move a little bit forward into into what is our presentation, and then let's see from now on. You know, we have now raised the issue about this, like what is what we are doing or what is what we can do, you know, to to raise professionalization, uh, the professionalization of the um, of the sector. But let's just start then by by quickly looking, you know, and reading here on the slide. What do we mean, or what is the definition of professionalism? So professionalism, we are going to have a, a working uh, kind of a definition of being the skill, the judgment, and behavior expected from a person or an organization who can undertake a job well. So obviously what we wouldn't like to see, and unfortunately we often see, is many shortcuts. You know? We see um, drillers that um, are not uh, certified for work, that they don't have the capacity, we often see regulations that uh, are non-existent or they are not adhered to, um, and many other issues that we will uh, see now during the presentation and that we propose to have a, a focus and attention. So, improving drilling professionalism, we have to, of course, admit that it's not a one-off activity. It's just it's much more, it's more a process, right? Um, Based on, on, on our day-to-day -day work, what we see is that it can take several years actually to raise standards, uh, and it really requires uh, continued vigilance and, and, and you know and to, to pay you know attention to, to this issue. But the rewards of, of a professional sector are enormous for, for the, the economy of, of the countries that we are working uh, with. Um, long-term prosperity and employment, and, and indeed what we are uh, really after here, which is to meet the universal access to, to drinking water and to meet the, the sustainable um, development uh, goal. Um, so what we've done is over the last years, the, the partners uh, supporting the, the sustainable groundwater development chain within the rural water supply network we have focused on, on advanced the thinking, and we have developed, as you can see on the, on the screen, different manuals um, on borehole drilling. Uh, what you see is, is kind of the core document, which is the code of practice for cost-effective boreholes. That is uh, assigning nine key principles, you know, around, around you know, um, cost-effective boreholes. And, and then to support this, the code of practice, we have gone into more detail and we have developed this other set of, of technical guidance around sustainable groundwater development, costing and pricing, um, procurement and contract management, siting of, of, of drill water wells, and also very important supervision of, of water well drilling. But let's say that, that broadly speaking, these documents focus on what to do, right? It's, it's, it's more um, about what. What, is, uh, what needs to happen. Now, recently, we are uh, driving a little bit much more attention, um, and we are really um, willing to discuss how to raise professionalism of groundwater development. So as a result of a very thorough consultative process, and uh, you know, discussing with many of our UNICEF country offices, but also with many of the partners of our partners, and with sector specialists and, and gurus, let's say, um, even more well, obviously, Kirsten is one of, <laughs> of the most important ones. But you know, it's been a it's been a very detailed work, gathering a lot of insights and putting a lot of thought into into coming up with with this guidance note that we are presenting today. Um, the result of all this thinking is is synthesized, as you can see on the slide, and it was already introduced by Rob at the beginning in the six proposed areas of engagement uh, that you can see. This is about um, institutional frameworks, groundwater information, project design, implementation, and monitoring, capacity, investment, and dialogue and awareness. As you may also identify, this, all, this covers, if you have the chance to take a look in the, 
in the slide before, is cover most of the underlying reasons for failure uh, that we've seen um, in the slide before. But let's unpack a little bit more each of these uh, hexagons that we <laughs> like to refer to, you know, these six areas of engagement that we, we refer to as the hexagons now. Let's see a little bit more in detail. So the first one, it's um, as we've seen institutional frameworks. So what is the problem here? So what we see is that in many countries, the laws, regulations, procedures, as well as the, the responsibilities for groundwater development and management of the resource are in many cases, they are not clear or, or even worse, they are contradictory. So responsibilities may fall between or be divided among different ministries in different national and provincial or even at district uh, level administrations. We see also that countries lack technical guidance for borehole construction and rehabilitation in many cases. And as you can imagine, the, the combination of all these weaknesses is what well, results is in, in overlapping mandates and, and overall confusion. Um, and this is clearly undermining the professionalization uh, and the professionalism of, of groundwater development. So what we are proposing here is, is to promote and undertake initiatives that help improve uh, the laws, the regulations and procedures of borehole drilling and, and, and their adherence. You know, we are, we are suggesting that, you know, to determine whether high quality boreholes are being consistently constructed in, in countries. We are suggesting to map out different drilling projects and programs to review existing national laws and regulations and procedures, and then just to assess, you know, whether whether these laws, regulations, and procedures are known, you know, and, and they are in place, and, and if so, whether they are being adhered to. It's very important, you know, a little anecdote, well, it's not an anecdote, but something that, you know, just, just to go a little bit more into practical things, uh, and to remember, Christian and myself, a few years ago, we were, and doing a manual drilling assessment in Lagos in Nigeria, you know, where, where we, what we saw is like literally, you know, like like dozens and, and, and tens and, and, and kind of, I would even say hundreds of drillers, you know, drilling, uh, you know, without having um, an idea of, of the standards that they were already outlined there in Nigeria. And, and, and then the sector not really being regulated with all the concerns, you know, and the risk. To, to groundwater development. We were, Christian and myself, we were on, on site, you know, seeing how some drilling um, team were actually drilling in, a, in the backyard of a house in, in, in Lagos, drilling over a carpet, you know, and then they have to quickly change the, the location. And then, you know, they were, then they were too quick to the latrine that they were building. So, yes, you know, this is just to give a little bit of an idea of, of what we see in the field and, and what we are trying to, to avoid. I pass it back to you, Preston, to continue with our areas. Thanks very much, Jose. So carrying on with these six areas of engagement, another area and is around groundwater information. And one of the, the participants asked to know more about groundwater. Um, and this is a problem not just in countries in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a global issue. Ideally, if you look at these pictures going around, let me just talk you through the pictures. Ideally, when you're drilling, the driller collects samples every meter, samples of the, the, the formation that is being drilled through. Those samples are used to develop a drilling log and used to really finalize the design as to where the, the, the casing is placed and where the screen is placed, the screen allows the water to fill the borehole, to pass through. So you need to look at the material to find out where there's the water. Those borehole logs, those records that show where the water is, where the layers are, where there's clay, those should be quality assured and collected in some form of database. So we're now right at the picture on the right, the database, the information from the thousands, tens of thousands boreholes that are being drilled in a particular country. When that information is quality shared in that database, it can then be used to analyze and to really understand more about what's happening underground. So, okay, how do these layers change? Where's the water level? What do we expect to find here? 
really to build up a picture of something which is a mystery because it's hidden. Groundwater is hidden treasure. And if that information is analyzed, it can be used to develop much more local, small-scale maps and descriptions, which in turn can be used by people who are trying to decide where to place boreholes, what to design, how deep to drill. So it's a continuous cycle from the soil, from the rock cuttings, from the ground, right through um, to drilling again. And that's just not happening enough. So there are countries with large-scale drilling programs happening, or many NGOs working in drilling, but the mechanisms for collecting that information and using it to really build up a picture of what's happening underground are just not enough. So that's something that really has to change. And this is a global issue. This is not just an African issue. The second area, or the third area of engagement is really around the specifics of project design, implementation, and monitoring. And I see here that I have, we have some people online who work in projects and some donors. And how projects are designed really affects the quality of the work. So the picture here on the left gives an example of a country where um, by the time the budgeting is finished and the contracts are signed, it's the rainy season. And in fact, what could be an eight or nine month drilling season gets compressed into six to 12 weeks. So there's a very short time frame for the drilling work to take place. It's a funnel. So you have a project design, you have a national um, system which funnels the drilling into a very short season. And when it's so short, it's extremely difficult to actually ensure quality. What else needs to be right? The implementation needs to be right. So that means ensuring that there is proper communication with the drillers. People understand exactly what they're doing. Clear procurement procedures, transparent, right through to the contract award so that everybody can play their role. And different programs are different at really making sure that you have good quality programs. And then finally, you get right through to the monitoring. And I showed you those pictures at the beginning. Actually, what's needed is to know who drilled those wells, when were they drilled, exactly what happened, so that that information about where things are going wrong can feed right back into the regulation of the sector. Drilling bad quality consistently, maybe they should be blacklisted. So those are some of the issues that need to be really thought through in project design. There's many more, but that's just to give you a bit of a flavor. Um, next area of engagement, and I'll try to finish so we can get to your questions, is around capacity. And there has particularly been a particularly strong drive towards privatization, towards private sector, so retrenchment, government staff leaving, and private drillers, private consultants doing the work. However, that has not generally run alongside strengthening skills and strengthening capacity. So you have private contractors trying to get technicians, but without skills to really train them properly in drilling, lack of apprenticeship programs. And this needs to change. And I'm really reaching out to you in Engineering for Change and beyond. What can the global community do to absolutely raise skills from technician level right through to project manager level. Because unless we, as a global community, raise those skills, we can never, never meet the sustainable development goals. So please, thinking caps on, what can we do to raise skills so that people can, you know, <laughs> people who are qualified, who understand what they're doing, can drill, can supervise, can oversee, and can manage projects. And um, another aspect of capacity, of course, is equipment. So we talk a lot about borehole cameras, which can help you to see. You can put a camera down, it has a, a, a lamp, you can, you can see a lot of what's happening in the well. But equipment such as that is very often completely absent, which makes it virtually impossible to diagnose the problem. Um, so another key issue there around um, engagement. Um, next slide, 15, it's my slide. Is it my? Yes. Last, last area, last of my areas, um, dialogue and awareness. I'm so excited. Dialogue and awareness. Um, another thing which is often absent 
is real exchange between the government and drilling contractors and the NGO to look at specific problems, to diagnose problems, to understand and to improve the sector. I think Uganda's got a very interesting case recently because they're trying to improve the regulation of drilling um, consultants, of those who supervise wells and site wells. And that's really a process of dialogue between the government and the private sector to come up with a system that works. So the dialogue is absolutely fundamental to build trust, to solve problems, and also much greater awareness amongst decision makers, amongst political leaders about the realities of drilling. And as Jose mentioned, drilling is risky. There are areas where it's quite difficult to find water. Even if you're fairly sure, there's always things that can go wrong. So there needs to be a real raising of global consciousness about groundwater, about drilling, about its importance. And again, being here at this webinar is a way of reaching out to, to you. Jose, I'm going to hand over to you again. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. So we are now in the in the final hexagon, in the final um, area of engagement that we are proposing in, in our joint guidance note. Um, and this is the final one, but it's obviously is not the it's not a, a non important one. It's actually really really important. It's about investment. Our working definition here of investment is is when when time or money is put into something, hoping that the returns will be greater than what it was originally put in. So obviously, 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 without the right investments in the areas of engagement that we have mentioned before, we doubt that we will see um, a raise in professionalism of the drilling sector. So the question that we want to raise here is, after all these um, explanations and and this presentation is, what do you think that we uh, need to invest in? So do you think that it could be wise just to invest only on, on infrastructure, you know, with this context that we have provided? Because again, you know, coming back to one of the comments at the beginning, you know, over the last few years, uh, the last 15 years, we've seen a push for numbers and numbers and numbers and to reach millions and beneficiaries. And the quality of construction has suffered without having investments, the right clever strategic investments in all these areas. And it doesn't need to be all at the same time in the same place, but you know, the right cocktail of investment in the right hexagons, let's say, you know, is what is going to make a difference. So we need to understand in each of the contexts in, in which of the hexagons we put some money, you know, beyond just purely the infrastructure um, so that we can say and we can, you know, sleep in peace and think that we are really doing the right thing to do, just not uh, building infrastructure. But as we have seen, you know, and, and wrapping a little bit and, and seeing what we've seen before, is going to fall in this repair within one or two years, you know. So when we have a chance and we are developing water national programs, let's really make cons be conscious, you know, and already at this level, let's make and think wisely and strategically where do we put the money in. Uh, so just with this last preaching, uh, let me just go with the last slide where we just wanted to share with you the, the links to some of the video clips that we have recently been developing in partnership with, with WaterAid as well, with our collection WaterAid. Uh, and these are very cute and short video clips that uh, you, you will, for sure you would like if, you're, if you like this subject, you know, about siting, about supervision, construction quality, and procurement and contract management. There are around five minutes video clips in both English and French. And these are very, very useful. Our colleagues in UNICEF like to have them handy, you know, whenever they have the chance to interact with, with uh, policy makers or higher level, you know, um, government officials who, you know, may be aware sometimes or sometimes not of the issues that we are discussing here. Great opportunity, you know, to, to in a nice way to raise all, all these issues and, and you know and to try the attention to all these underlying causes, you know, that we've seen at the beginning of the presentation. That's all from from our side. Just you know, we wanted to be rigorous and, and we wanted to at least uh, share some of the references 
and we have views uh, for the presentation and also for the guidance now. So just with this, we wanted to uh, say thank you very much for the attention. And we are aware that there are some issues uh, have been already raised and questions that, questions that have been posed on the chat. So I will have from our side, Kirsten and myself, we will be perhaps happy to have some, some interaction with, with you if time allows. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, both. That was very interesting, and uh, those are some great resources that you uh, provided at the end there. Um, I'd like to open up uh, the question and answer session now. Um, it, attendees, you can use the Q&A window. It's located below the chat window, and you can type your questions for, uh, for both presenters there. Um, some of you have already done so. And uh, I understand from looking at the, um, the discussion going on there that some of you have um, sent uh, your questions directly to the presenters. Uh, I'll go ahead and read a couple of the questions that have come in that we all can see. And then if, um, if either of you, um, Jose or, or Kirsten, would like to, uh, to jump in with a question that you have received privately. Uh, would you mind just reading the question also so we, so we can know um, what you're responding to? Um, with that said, uh, one, of the, one of the first questions that has uh, come in, what can be done to mitigate the impacts of corrosion in areas needing groundwater access but where the pH is below 6.5? Okay, let me try to respond to that question. Um, it's absolutely essential that galvanized iron is not installed in those wells. So what's recommended, for example, there's a pump that's commonly used, which is the, the India Mark II hand pump, and there are different models, huh? there are different types, and really what should be installed is stainless steel rising main and stainless steel pump rods that don't corrode. However, having... Um, recently looked in a particular country in, in West Africa at this, what's not clear is if the stainless steel on the market is actually the quality that it should be. So that's something that we, um, UNICEF, SCAT, as I already said, are, are trying to understand a little bit more in detail. Um, and then, of course, there are pumps like the Afridev, which use um, PVC. Of course, the issue is um, when installing hand pumps, it's important that there is a supply chain of spare parts. So for a specific NGO to suddenly install a completely different pump, um, it can be problematic because if people are not able to get the spare parts, then um, they can't um, repair the, the pump. So that's my kind of response to, to you there, really no galvanized iron. and we need to start looking at the, the quality of the stainless steel being imported into countries. Thank you. Great, thank you. Another question has come in. Um, how do drilling companies get contracts from UNICEF? Okay, I, will, I guess I will take this one. <laughs> uh, so a couple of points uh, just uh, to answer the question, but um, before addressing the question directly, I will do it directly, let's say. So just to mention that um, from from our UNICEF uh, from the UNICEF side um, and you know from the water perspective, what we want to see is that uh, governments you know uh, are more and more able to you know do um, and the right planning and design and procurement processes by themselves you know. Uh, so obviously um, the the first line of support is uh, in this direction to governments. Yes, uh, that they can handle their own procurement processes and they can procure and tender and procure themselves. And we are happy in many cases, you know, to assist them with providing technical advice on and revise um, all these processes. This is uh, this is uh, to start with uh, answering the question. Then, it is true, of course, that in many cases, uh, for many different reasons, including capacity reasons and, and other reasons. Um, we are um, directly implementing or we are really involved in the construction of boreholes. Uh, and here, let's say that there are two ways of doing this uh, from our side in, in UNICEF. 
either we partner with uh, civil society NGO implementing partners that they have the capacity to do this, and, and this um, this happens in, in many cases, or and the other line uh, is when we do really um, take over and we do um, handle the, the planning and procurement processes and tender ourselves. In this case, we uh, we have our protocol and we have our um, supply division based in Copenhagen uh, providing procurement advice to the organization. So we have a regular tender process where we uh, open um, processes um, for uh, we request for proposals or what we do invitations to, to bid, uh, and then we we follow international pro, uh, procedures enough you know, for uh, for procurement. In our case, we are right now revisiting with our colleagues in supply division all these standard process to to streamline a little bit uh, and to be consistent across country offices with issues. You know, as you can imagine, there are uh, issues in terms of whether we pay or we don't pay for external discussions for fly boreholes, and whether uh, siting or supervision is included in one contract or the other. But this is a, this is a little bit the way we, we do it. Just to, to perhaps make another mention in different processes when we are really in developing context and, and we can do procurement processes in more in a paid way. Uh, as you may be aware, in UNICEF, we are also uh, very much responding to humanitarian crisis where we have to really streamline uh, procurement processes to deal with these emergencies and, and we procure directly. Just, just the, uh, I hope that I have answered the question, but it's like it's a little bit of a protocol kind of answer, but that's, that's the way we do it. Thank you. Um, uh, a couple of people are asking about, uh, the, about whether or not there's a global database uh, for adding uh, Records. Uh, one person asked specifically about uh, a global database for boreholes. Um, is there are there any resor any resources around that um, yeah. already? Let me respond to that. So there is no global database for boreholes. These are borehole records, drilling logs are collated, if at all, at national level. Many countries have databases or had databases or have systems that are partially functional. Um, there's a, and there's a question from Adam Boff here. He asked about Uganda. Uganda actually has a very good system. Um, so what you need to do in that case, and this applies to many countries, is go to the Ministry um, of Water and Environment, the Directorate of Water Resources in Entebbe, and get the forms um, for, for drilling records. And in fact, any private drilling company that wants to get a license has got to submit its drilling records to Entebbe in order to be able to get the license. That's how the system should work. So you get in Uganda, there is a system set up. So it's not UNICEF, it's really the government. So go to, go to them and find out um, what forms they have and make sure that you submit that information back to them. It's one of the countries which has got a very good system and a lot of information available actually on groundwater small-scale um, maps. Yeah, back to you, Rob. Thank you. Um, another, uh, another question, um, maybe, maybe you can give a ballpark. Um, someone would like to know how much does a groundwater project cost? <laughs> Great question. Um, it, I mean, yeah, coming back to Jose's point, it depends what you include. Do you, um, do you just include the drilling? Do you include the apron? Do you include the pump? Do you include the supervision, the siting? What do you include? And the second question, the second point, of course, is it also depends on where you're drilling and how deep you're drilling. When I first came to this topic um, in 2005, um, I was being pushed to come up with average drilling prices for countries. And I really pushed back because... Um, it, the average depends on where has been drilled in the country because uh, you have such variation. So there's a huge range of prices um, really depending on what you're drilling, where you're drilling. Also, if you're going to work in a conflict area or an area with high risk, your drilling costs are going to go up. So I'm not going to answer the question directly. Huge range. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, an another uh, interesting question uh, that just came in is about solar pumping. 
the question is that uh, it looks like uh, prices for those systems have really been dropping in the past decade, and um, this person would like to know your views on whether it's a viable option. Yeah, do you want to take this question, or Sarah, would you like me to take the question? We, maybe we can take in turns. I can say that uh, from our side in UNICEF, we have just conducted an assessment on solar systems. Actually, you know, it's about to be published in the next few days. We have just run that, um, uh, some comments. As, as the question already acknowledges, the prices have gone down. Um, what we have found out with this uh, global assessment that we've done uh, with our uh, interventions, UNICEF supported interventions on solar systems, we also see um, a little bit the um, demystification of um, of the issues of uh, of um, the sustainability of the systems. You know, sometimes we have always thought that they were the partners were robbed or um, that they were destroyed, etc. So what we have found out with our assessment is actually that the issues with solar systems are more in terms of the dimension, the dimension in other systems. We we tend to see in many countries a copy. Uh, and paste, you know, of, of the dimensioning of the systems, and obviously that's not ideal. We also see issues, you know, around solar systems that relate to the governance and tariff setting, and you know, and targeting the most poor and marginalized when these uh, solar systems are linked to, to pipe systems. Um, so, and, and the other issue that we see a lot, you know, is, is the upgrade of um, boreholes that were drilled to be fit with hand pumps and then are being upgraded into into uh, pipe systems. And what we see is the lack of understanding of the groundwater resource, you know, uh, and this is a major problem because some uh, some of the aquifers obviously that we are tapping may be fine with a hand pump, uh, you know, um, taking an amount of water. Uh, but, you know, as soon as these systems are upgraded into solar systems, and then also, you know, beyond drinking water are also feeding more irrigation systems, then we're talking about something different. And then we are calling for um, for um, a more thorough groundwater investigation. Of course, there's no reason to add. No, nothing to add. Absolutely everything covered. Great. Has either of you received any private uh, questions that I haven't asked yet that that maybe I can't no, see on the I public screen. No, I think that there's more questions coming through. I see a couple of really interesting questions, but um, nothing private. Okay, no. wait, what, okay. Would you like to go ahead and read read uh, one of the questions and sure. give us an answer? Um, yeah, no, great question from Andrew Belco and Jose. Now we're now yes. we're getting into trouble. <laughs> yeah. We have a professional drillers or consultants that can come out for capacity building. We are. This is where we're trying to move into yeah. is we have um, an agreement running for we'll start in April, really focusing on capacity building. And, you know, what we need to get our roster, uh, people who can work, who can provide training, who can provide skills. Um, we already have some really great training materials, um, short courses. Of course, that's not the same as having a proper a vocational training center or college or technical institute that goes into depth. But there are materials there. There are some good people there. And we're now on a process of really trying to see who can do this, because the scale of what needs to be done is huge. Um, and of course, if there are, amongst those attending, if there are those of you who would like to run courses, who would like to see if you can trigger in-country um, processes to start, contact us and let's see how we can explore because it's about bringing together good quality people, good quality materials and resources to move this huge issue forward. Do you know what you want to add there, Jose? No, no, this question comes so nicely because this is really the, the discussions we are having the two of us, you know, how to you know, to, to exactly to, to try to build. Sometimes we refer to we want to be kind of a little army, you know, of That's of uh, colleagues who can support this. Yes. Yeah. So just get in touch and let's just keep this moving. And I see we're running out of time. I'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't have anything else. Uh, yes, but we are running out of time. We have a couple of minutes left. Is, is there uh, one one last quick question you'd like to take, or any uh, closing comments you'd like to make? Okay, now let me have a quick look. So I responded um, to Diana, put something in the text box. Different contract types. 
Um, very good question, Anna. And I think that very much depends on the context. But one thing I would say is be very much aware of turnkey contracts where you only pay for successful boreholes. Because often, depending on what is counted, you get other things that are missing. So contracts where you have good quality supervision, making sure and supporting the driller to do a good job um, and being paid for the work that they are done, that's what I would say. And I'm quite strong on that. Um, Steve, you citing and drilling cannot be well put. Absolutely. We're talking about the need for a huge cadre of experienced qualified professionals. So I hope that in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years, that we have the hundredfold, the thousandfold change in professionalism that we need in order to meet those SDGs. So um, all of you, get your thinking caps on <laughs> and let's try and move this together because certainly UNICEF and SCAT cannot move this alone. Um, anything for you to add, um, Jose? Mm, no, I don't think so. I'm very happy the way that this has gone on and very interesting questions that I think have helped us, you know, clarify a little bit more yeah. the topic. So we're yeah. very good. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, both uh, very interesting presentation. I appreciate the, the the time you spent with us and that concludes our webinar. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you all.